Thank you for your time Thank and um, for agreeing to talk to you. Um, Robert, a lot of people will know you as Crichton Fred Dwarf <laughs> uh, and more latterly Scrap Heap Challenge, but since 2010 you've been presenting a YouTube series called Fully Charged. For our viewers who haven't seen it yet, please can you explain to them what's it all about? I mean, it is simply, I mean, the, the strap line we eventually came up with was the future of energy and transport. So it's really looking at where that, that those two sectors are going. So it isn't just cars. I mean, it's very much, the cars are definitely at the forefront, but it is also about the renewable energy industry, the, the technology that's developing around that. So it's not just, you know, solar panels or wind turbines or tidal power or anything. It's how those are being integrated into the grid, how the grid has to be more intelligent and better interconnected in the future, regardless of electric cars. I mean, this is sort of a, almost a side thing, but it is absolutely uh, that everyone's interested. Everyone who gets an electric car starts to think, where does the electricity come from? That's the first thing I thought. And it was only then when I then got back into a petrol car, I went, oh, where does the petrol come from? Because we don't think about that. You know, it's the normal thing. It's like you turn a light on and... A, the light comes on. I don't know where that's from. It just yeah. comes on. I'm not. I'm too busy. I don't yeah. know. And the same with I buy petrol and it's expensive. And then you go, I don't know where that's from. And so then that opens up that in a way a Pandora's box of questions about how that operates. And then you, yeah. some key things. And I think really important arguments are that we have to import. I don't know how much, what percentage is most of the oil that we burn in this country mm. has to come from somewhere else, which means it's we're money is leaving our economy to pay for it yeah. in colossal amounts every day and when you see a wind turbine or a, a big solar farm or someone's roof with solar panels on it that's that's that power from here we're not importing that from anywhere yeah. we're not paying for it from somewhere else the money is staying in this economy you know there's that argument which i think go across the polit political spectrum people get that and they go Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Doesn't matter whether it's because it, it felt like the renewables were sort of hippie fringe madness, which is where it came from. I mean, I saw I, I lived in a farm in um, Wales in the 1970s that had a wind turbine because it didn't have any electricity, and the people who lived there, two of them were uh, engineering graduates, yeah. so they knew how to do it. You know, okay. so that was a really yeah, and I was. 17, 18, and I was knocked out by it. I thought, this is amazing. Man, yeah, we can all be independent. We can all live in, you know, <clears throat> things have moved on. But a lot of those people then went on to really were the foundation of what is now the, a very big industry, the, the wind industry. Yeah. You know, and if you saw that wind turbine now, you go, that is... Oh. It, it, even, it wouldn't even have got on scrap heap. It was that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I think it's those... The, the, the shift, I think, is fascinating. I was fascinated by the shift that the internet had mm. on my industry, the television industry, really, and much more. So my muso friends, the musicians, they really did have a bit of a shock with that because they used to sell things called records, yep. which your younger readers <laughs> won't know about, but, you know, and they'd make money out of it. No, well, they don't, you know, it's very different. But in a similar way, electric cars kind of are a di uh, disruptive technology. They mess up the existing system. Yeah, in more ways than one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so formerly a petrol head, um, and now obviously an electric car and renewable energy advocate. Um, can you explain why you took such a change in direction personally? I mean, I think there was always, an, I always had an interest in what at that time, a long time ago, was called alternative technology or low impact technology. And I was kind of intrigued by that because... I grew up during the oil crisis of the early 1970s and I only rode, I didn't have a car, I didn't drive, but, but I rode bikes, but I saw the impact that, that had on British society, which was profound. I mean, you would see five mile long queues to get into a petrol station to buy one gallon and people pushing their cars because they didn't want to use the remaining petrol they had. And you don't, I didn't forget that. And I thought that is, this is a very frail, I think it, at that age, when you're that age, this is a very frail system we're relying on totally for our, for the way we live, and it can go wrong that easily. I think that that was that made a big impact on me. And then, of course, you forget it. And I had children, and I had a house, and it had LPG gas, and we had cars that used petrol, and we, you know, I don't know what. It's just petrol. Shut up! I've got to go and get some nappies. You know, it kind of that all went by the by. Yeah. 
And it was then really from doing Scrap Heap, when we'd made um, Scrap Heap in America, we made an American version called uh, Junkyard Wars, which we made in California. And that was early 2000s. A huge amount of stuff was going on, which I slowly became aware of in the world of electric vehicles, because they really came out of Silicon Valley. They came out of people who'd made lap phones, laptops, who understood about battery management, about software, and how software can change the way the batteries operate and look after them for longer totally outside the automotive industry and that i saw the fledgling sort of electric vehicle development happening then which really i was fascinated by but i didn't think it was going to do anything i genuinely didn't i thought well i was at the time i first went in an 100 percent electric car which was an experimental kind of dragster thing really impressive very fast but i just went that's daft it had a range of like eight miles wow. but it was using actual laptop batteries strapped in a box really not neatly done since 2001 i think uh and then i got back into the car that one of the crew i was working with lent me which was a 1969 fastback mustang so you know you, it was the pe- it was like petrol head god car yeah. you know it was like oh my god this is what steve mcqueen drove and it was green wow. and when you st- if you revved it when you were at the lights it twisted Vroom, it did that you know which was just and it was a terrible car to drive rubbish brakes steering was a joke absolutely hopeless at going around corners but fantastic noise you know so I was right that was where my head was at at that time yeah so definitely not like an eco cycling anything I mean I'd always rode bikes to be fair but it took like eight or nine years for that stuff to develop. So then Tesla was formed out. In fact, the car I went in was people testing the drivetrain for the Tesla road, what became the Tesla Roadster, the first electric sports car. And I don't know the detailed history, but I think at that time I met, one, not Elon Musk, he wasn't anything to do with them, but some of the really key engineers behind that. But at the time, it was just some blokes on a drag strip. I had no idea who they were. I didn't know what they were talking about. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is Tesla. Yeah. No, that didn't exist. Tesla was a, a, an electrical engineer from the, you know, a hundred years before. Yes. Uh, so it, it wasn't overnight, but it was a slow change. And once I started driving electric cars regular, I went, this is really special. This is really different. This is mm. some other thing is happening here. It's not just another car, like a diesel car or a hydrogen. You know, it just felt like this is something that's really going to make a big change if it takes off. Yeah. And it was impossible to tell then. In fact, it would look very likely it wouldn't take off. There would be a little blip. And, and, and in, a, in a similar way to how, at the turn of the last century, electric cars were in the majority in America. Most cars were electric. And then um, Charles F. Kettering invented the starter motor, <laughs> who was developing electric motors for Ford, yeah. for, uh, as electric Ford Model T's you know they did actually produce them and you said once you find that out you go oh, this has got a long history it's mm, not yeah, overnight um, and there were electric cars in 1908 with 100 miles range which it, which it took you know a long time to get back to that with lithium ion but you know yeah. that, but, so yeah I mean that, that I, the topic interested me a great yeah. deal and, and how have you seen people's perception changed about electric vehicles I think, I, I mean, I've noticed a huge shift because I think it was generally very sceptical uh, to start with and for really, with, for, with really good reason. There was no charging infrastructure. They didn't go very far on a charge. They were hugely more expensive. They just seemed like a ridiculous, you know, uh, whatever that awful term is. Um, uh, what's that? What's that annoying signal? Uh, for, for not for vanity signaling. What's that term, Ben? Huh? What that signaling thing? Virtual, Virtual, Virtual. signaling. I hate that term. But anyway, it did seem like I was driving an electric car that had green flowers painted on it because it was eco. It's a bloody car made in a factory yeah. out of materials that someone's dug out of the ground with a big digger. It's not. But it's different, you know. So, you know, that stuff was a bit annoying. But that passed. And I think there was, it was absolutely, if someone gets the chance to drive one, mm. that changes 80% of their opinions about it instantly you know that that and that has been proved again and again that they'll have a one go in one they go oh it's a car <laughs> and you drove through a puddle and you didn't get electrocuted yeah, you know normal. so it's normal yeah. yeah yeah so i guess that probably answers my next question because a lot of people complain um, especially on our facebook page that evs are too expensive the infrastructure isn't there it takes too long to charge a yeah. car uh, what do you think needs to change before some of those uh, naysayers shall we say, for want of a better word, will convert. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the best things you can do is to download the, I think it's called iPace, it's the iPad, the app that 
Jaguar have released that that you, before you've got an electric car. So drive your own okay. car, but use and it, um, obviously it tracks where you're going and your journeys. But what it does is it tracks your journeys and just keeps a list of them. So you then see how far you drive, and what it then does is calculate how much electricity that would use in an iPace and how much that would cost you. Okay. And at the end of a, a month of doing that, you'll go, oh, that. So all that driving I did, most of those journeys were under 20 miles, which you won't believe until you see it there. A couple of them were 70 miles. You know, you see, I've got to charge the iPace twice in a week and it will cost 10 quid. And it also tells you how much, what, if you've got a car then and you say what your car is and what its MPG is, it tells you how much that costs, which is 140 quid. And you go, oh, <laughs> it I makes see, sense. I can do it. I need to charge it twice a week and da, 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 da. You know, so that stuff, it's education. It's how you communicate. That's the, one of the simplest methods I've seen. Now, of course, I can't remember the name of the app, but there'll be, there's someone here from Jaguar. I think it is the iPace. I think I've got it on my phone, but I'll, I'll spend hours looking for it. So it, it is that understanding that you don't have to charge it every 10 minutes. Mm. You don't have to wait 96 hours while it's charging. The car, we're, my wife and I are driving currently, a, a Hyundai Kona does over 300 miles on a charge, which we're surprised at. Mm. But we're, that's what we get. In the winter, it's slightly less, so 280. At the moment, we're getting 320, 330 miles on a oh. charge out of it. And my wife's driven electric cars for a long time, begrudgingly, because that's what she's had to. Yes. And she doesn't, and, and she then talked about it to her friends and how she's got to find the charger and it's annoying when the charger's not and now they go, where did you charge the car? And she said, I don't know. She can't remember because she's driven to London and back into Stratford and back into there and back. And it's, and it's you know, you don't charge it. Charge it a couple, one or two times a week at the most. Mm. And we charge it at home, that one, nearly all the time because it's it goes so far that you just don't. It, what it does, that one did for me the first time I wrote it, was return me to how boring and annoying driving is. Because yeah. there was a period where driving became an adventure. Yeah. Can I get to the next charger? Will it work? You know, it's exciting. And suddenly in the Kona, I drove to Nottingham, did a talk, drove back. I was tired. It was late at night. And I got home and I, it, it still had 60% left. And I was going, oh, and I'd done 200 miles. I was going, ah, oh, that's just like a boring petrol car. I want a challenge. I want less range. <laughs> you need to buy a car with less range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and how, how do you think the government can encourage electric car use? <sighs> I think it is. I think government's role is with charging, not only charging infrastructure, as, as in the actual physical stuff. It's to it's to get the charging companies to make that uh, the most, the the least, uh, um, a really smooth and simple operation. So you drive up to a charger, you plug your car in, and it starts charging. Mm. You know, with the least amount of of grit in the system, you know, so the, the, and friction, because that is a you know, that's the early adopter's pain. And there's, I've never met anyone who goes, oh, I love having the app or the special, the pack of 50 different cars for different charges. <laughs> no one wants that. No. And there are now, you know, I've just driven a couple of cars where literally the car knows the charger, the charger knows the car, you plug the car and it starts charging straight away, you do nothing. Still paying for the electricity, yeah. but your account is with the car. And that kind of, that come on, sense. guys, it's not that hard to no. do. Come on, let's sort that out. And it's really, da that's down to the manufacturers. But with government, you know, the places that have done that, California is a good example. There's one tag in California that operates all public charges. So you need, you do need a tag still, but you walk up the thing, and that's your account with that tag. It doesn't matter who put the charger in, okay. and that's a that's a Californian government legislation. And the same in Ireland, Makes you have one sense. tag, and you can charge on anything. Mm. So it doesn't matter where you are. You've got to. You know, it just works. And it's got to be that simple. Or tap to pay, which is what the big... Ecotricity. E uh, no, not yet. <laughs> I don't want to say anything about ecotricity. <laughs> he said two hours, only two hours left. So one more question with a two-hour answer. Oh, no, no question. <laughs> um, we, we all know that electric vehicles are much more cleaner in terms of emissions than petrol and diesel cars. Yeah, local emissions, yes, yeah. definitely. But there is an environmental impact in their manufacturing... How do you see this improving? I think it's the best thing of all. The best criticism for electric cars is what about the impact of extracting the materials and everything, which we never asked mm. about fossil fuels or the manufacturing of those cars. And we should have done, 
So we should be asking about that now. We should specifically be asking about it now. But I think it's really good that we ask that now because that makes the manufacturers go, as they are now doing, we have to source ethical cobalt. We have to source ethical materials for our cars. Yeah. And that's because of public pressure going, hang on a minute. You're going to make us these fancy pants electric cars. They've got to be. We've got to know where those materials are come from. I think the big difference, though, is you extract the materials to build a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. And that car drives for 10, 15 years on that battery. And then it's taken out and it's repackaged to power a building for another 10 to 15 years. And then at the end of that, no one is going to throw that stuff away. It's too valuable and it can be recycled. And however much you argue for clean diesel, efficient petrol engines, you can only burn that fuel once. It lasts about a tenth of a second. Yeah. You know, if you take a tiny bit of that energy that's in that. You know, the equivalent of energy that's in a... 18650 battery cell, which is what's in a Tesla, is a drip of fossil fuel. It is literally a drip which lasts less than a second and then it's burnt very inefficiently. But you can use that material in that battery again. And that, one of the reports I heard, and I'm going to be asking about this tomorrow, which was from a battery scientist at a big conference in London about minerals extraction and minerals trading, is that they've, they're now discovering that the materials they're extracting from old batteries and reusing make better batteries. And I think this can't last forever, no. but maybe for the one first time it's recycled because they can refine it in such a way that it actually makes a better battery, a higher co energy capacity battery the second time around, which is like very counterintuitive. You think it would be a bit of a rubbish battery the second time <laughs> around. But so they are talking about 95% of the materials in a battery pack can be reused, okay. which is you know, a different, it still needs to be done. It's very energy intensive. Mm. It requires a lot of chemicals. It's got to be done in, under, in ways that are sustainable. Mm. You know, there's not, not all the answers are there, but the fact that it's possible to do that is very different. And it's only going to improve this technology. And I think that will improve because I think it's a big business opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of money going into it. Yeah. Which vehicles do you think have been the most important in the development of electric cars? I mean, because it, uh, I'm definitely not a Tesla fanboy. I don't want to be, but you can't deny it. They changed the picture. So one upstart, annoying company run by a fairly socially challenging gentleman, uh, you know, have, you know, scared the living daylights out of very well-established, long-term big companies, you know, like really big companies that are worth billions of pounds have gone Oh my God, everyone's stopped buying our cars in California and they're buying these. Tesla, you've got to say Tesla, I think South Korea and China. So Hyundai, Kia, very, I mean, they're make, they're, they've kind of paced themselves and made, you know, in a sense, next, second generation electric cars. They're completely in a different paradigm. They've got the same range as a, as a $100,000 Tesla for half, less than half the price. So that, that is really changing. Um, I think Volkswagen and Honda will be the next two next year that we'll see that we're really cheaper, smaller ca electric cars that a lot more people can afford. You know, with, with range that's very usable, 200 miles plus is, is I think the big change.